computer begins to operate and he is hosting you around you in or on his prosperity because of fire. Do you not yet see that all that you need is in me to get this in the other direction? Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Kai Winstead on behalf of the leadership team, AKA the dream team. We would love to welcome you to another Sunday service here at Many Nations Assembly. As a reminder, we are a non-denominational church that believes in training, reigning, and multiplying, all right? So if you believe that, can I get some fire? Fire and emojis, you know, in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, with all that being said, uh, welcome. You know, we got some, we got some things happening today. I don't, I don't know. I've already told PJB just to take it easy on me. I don't know what it is about like the solar eclipse that happened, but I'm tired. I don't know about y'all. I'm tired. So today, I'm praying for strength. Okay, and I'm praying not to throw any shoes. I don't, I don't know about y'all. I'm praying not to throw any shoes, okay? Right. I know we say, you know, take your shoes off, get comfortable. Um, but PJB has said that she does not like things being thrown at her. So I guess that is the, the announcements for the day. Do not throw things at the pastor in person nor virtually. I don't make the rules. I'm just here to share them with you. Not that I agree or anything, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, guys. But seriously, we are in for a treat as we are every Sunday. And we're going to go ahead and get things rolling today. We're going to go right into scripture and prayer. So this month, we are coming from Deuteronomy chapter 10, uh, verses 12 through 21. And we are reading from the New King James. New King James Version. My goodness, can y'all tell I wasn't church? Amen. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it reads, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your or for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him. And to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise and he is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Heavenly Father, we simply thank you. We thank you for being our God. Father, with the way the world is turning out, the way that people are not waking up every morning, Father God, we just simply take a moment to just choose a side. We take a moment to choose you as our God. To renew the vow, the covenant that we have made with you, Father God. We remember today that we are your bride, your chosen people, a peculiar people, Father God. And right now we just declare in this atmosphere that we declare that you are not just our savior, but you are our God, you are our Lord, and we submit to you. 
we allow heaven to fall down in this place to cause us to take a position of reverence, Father God. We come to give you the praise that is deserving of your name, Father God. For you are the same, Father, who administers justice, but you are the same God who makes our enemies fall to their knees. We thank you for your thunder and your rain. We thank you for the sunshine, and we also thank you for the pain, for you have caused us to want to circumcise ourselves that we choose to inflict ourselves so that we would be more like you, that we would cut off anything that would separate us from you. We thank you that you are a good God, a good, good Father. We thank you that there is nobody like you, Father. Nobody. Father, we are reminded in this text, Father, you are our praise. Your name alone is worthy of praise. That is enough to want to shout. That is enough to want to wave our hands. That is enough to fall down at our knees at the weight of your name, Father. So we simply give you the praise that belongs to you and you alone. It is not in our might, it is not in our strength, but it is according to your will, it is according to your character, it is according to the way that you have purposed us. For such a time as this, Father. So we simply thank you. We set the tone in this atmosphere right now, Father God, that this will be a place of praise. That when they look upon this hill, Father God, that they will say that that is a place of praise. When they look at us as individuals, they will say that is a place of praise. That they praise the God of God, the Lord of Lords. We thank you, Father, for making us witnesses. We thank you that we overcome by the word of our testimony. We thank you that when we go out into the streets, that the people that we are encounter, that we are a living testimony, that your word is written all over us in blood, paid on the cross, Father God. So we simply, again, give you the praise that you deserve. You have been our steady waters, our firm foundation. You have been that which we hide under. You are our refuge. Father, no matter what is happening, no matter what things may look like, we simply give you praise in advance. We choose to open our mouths and say thank you. Thank you for everything that you have done, everything that you will do. And we will not forget who it is that you are to us. Father, it is holy and it is right to you. Amen. Amen. All right, with that, we're going to continue the praise and we're going to go straight into a song of worship. This is the day that the Lord has made and we make a conscious decision that we're going to rejoice. We're going to give God the glory today. If you know our God is great and great to be praised, I need you to raise this real big with us wherever you are. Let's go. One, two, one, two, three, two. Listen, change, I need your help. Just lift those hands. See, I need. 
to say, but your pride is real. Come on, lift those hands if that's your heart, if that's the posture of your heart today. No matter what's going on around me, your pride. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I like that song that just came, that just went out. Um, yeah, we was in here having a good old, good old praise session. All right? All right. So, those that are here in person and virtually, our praise shall continually be in my mouth. Okay? All right. My name is Prophetess JP, and I am bringing to you tithes and offerings, aka partner with God. Can All I get right. a whoop whoop? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so as I was preparing to do tithes and offerings, something came to mind, right? And it's a story in the Bible about a woman and her son. Yeah. And I'm never the person that can like tell you exactly what scripture it is. But I can tell you the story that it that is from, right? Okay, all, right. all right. So picture this: this is nineteen, uh, whenever that was in the Bible. Okay. Um, the woman and her son. They was on their last morsel of food. Like she only had enough to make some bread, or as they called it, cake, in the Bible, right? And and stay with me, and I bless you. Okay. And I think it was Elijah. I know it was the prophet of God, right? I think it was Elijah. Don't quote me on that. Elijah came and he asked her to make him her last morsel of food. And she was wondering, you know, I only got enough to make for me and my child. Right. And then after that, we gonna die. Like she had she ain't giving up. Like we we out. We just gonna eat and eat. You know, that's it. Eating, eh, you know, that's, that's it. That's it. You know. Well, she decided to be obedient to the word of God. And decided to, to make this last morsel of food for the prophet. And I thought about it and was like, she gave up her last for a man of God. Think about that. Yeah. How many of us would give our last, not just for God, but for the man of God? Right. Like how many of us would, this is all I have. Yeah. I only got enough to eat for this one meal and then I'm out of here. But you want me to, to give you my last? Yeah. Yeah. What do I have to lose? Everything. Yeah. Oh, that's good. But when God asks you to give your last All right. so that he can replenish, you don't even know the other side of your last. Yeah. You don't even know that when you give your last, God has already got a package behind him. Yeah. Like, as soon as she give me this, I got this for her. Yeah. And it's way more than you could think. See, when she decided that she was going to make this cake or bread for Elijah, yeah. God saw fit mm -hmm. that she was never hungry again. Yeah, 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 her yeah. nor her son yeah. ever went without bread again. Yeah. Yeah. See? I don't think y'all understand me. See? Her nor her son so because of her obedience, yeah. 
her son now gets to reap the benefit yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah, her yeah. obedience. Yeah, yeah. All right? So, with that being said, I want you to take this moment to consult your father and ask him, what of my last do you want from me? Now, that's a hard question. <laughs> that is a hard question. Wow. But what Jeez, of man. my last do you want from me? I promise, if you just give him what you got, all you can have is a shout of a hallelujah, and that could be your last. But give him what you got. I promise you, what's on the other side of that is far better than what you're looking at right now. So with that being said, we can give in three ways. I always say this, but it's never failed. Me yet. Hallelujah. You can give with your treasures, your time, or your talent. We can take the time to do everything else, but we can't take the time to give God his just due time. That's a problem. So, if all you have is time, and you don't have a dime to your name, give him your time. If all you have is your talent, give him your talent. If he has placed it on your heart to give financially, the ways of giving should be being placed in the chat. Um, there's also a QR code that just popped up on your lower third right there on the screen right there. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the ways that you can partner with God. Please join me as we bow before the throne of our King. Father, we come to you thanking you and praising you. We thank you for the last that we have. And we thank you for the many more that you will bless us with. Father, I know we ask this question, what of my last do you want from me? So pr I pray that when we ask this question to you, that we really mean it. And that we do it cheerfully oh God that when we give it that we're not worrying about what's being done with it or who's going to do what with it or who's is going to but God that when we give it we know that it's for your kingdom that we've given it because you asked us to give it so Father I thank you I thank you that you're a that your replenishment is far greater than what we give. Father, this isn't about money. This isn't about dollars and coins. This isn't, a, this isn't about a pastor's car or a pastor's suit or the pastor's hair. This is about whew, sowing into your kingdom. And it does not have to be through money. But Father, we understand that to take care of your kingdom requires more. It requires more time. It requires more talent. And it requires more money. Yeah. Yeah. If we want to get out there and do the things that you want us to do, then Father, I know you will make a way. So, Father, we thank you for the many ways that you have us reaching the many nations. Father, it's in the name that your word will reach many nations. So, Father, we thank you. Father, we ask right now that you touch our hearts, touch us from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, oh God. That because of our obedience, wherever we step is anointed. Whatever we touch is anointed. Whatever we say or think is anointed, O oh God. May our thoughts be your thoughts, O oh God. May our words be your words, O oh God. So keep us. Continue to bless us. Continue to protect us, O oh God. We understand that your blessings don't come in monetary value, Father. 
we understand that a lot of times it comes in our health. That because we're still able to sit here and shout and dance and sing and clap our hands and use our limbs to be able to look and speak and feel, oh God. To be able to sit here in our right minds, oh God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that the things that could have happened, that should have happened, that would have happened without your protection, that they didn't happen, oh God. We thank you for your divine timing, for your will and your way, oh God. Worship your holy name. Wherever I have fallen short in this prayer, oh God, I pray that you make up the difference in me. Stand up in my weaknesses. Stand up in what I did not say, oh God. These and many other blessings I do pray. In Jesus the Christ's name, amen and bless God. Somebody lift your hands as we celebrate the greatness of our God. He's great and he's greatly to be praised. This little worship song that says this, our God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. Come on, our God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Give strength where I've been weak. Forever he'll reign. Come on, say, my God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. He heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weak. Forever he'll reign. Come on, if you believe it, lift your voice and say, Come on, if you know it's awesome, say it.
belongs to you. I thank you that in this moment, you have consecrated me. You have set me apart so that it is in you that I live, move, and have my being. I thank you that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, I thank you that it will be acceptable in your sight. I thank you that every word that comes forth from my mouth I thank you that you would allow it to be approved and sanctioned by you so that it is not I that they hear, but my Father that resides on the inside of me. So I thank you for the opportunity to partner with you, to engage in the same activity as you, to be used as a vessel by you to do this good work. I thank you for the fruit of this work. I thank you for the hearts of your people that will receive the word that is being sown. And I thank you, Lord, that your perfect will will be done. Let me go forth at the pace of your grace. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And bless the name of the Lord. The book of Nehemiah, chapter six. And we're going to begin at verse four. Again, that's Nehemiah, chapter six, beginning at verse four. And although we will absolutely cover more ground in this scripturally, for the purpose of our collective reading, I would like for us to anchor our time together in verses four through 14 using the New King James Version of the Bible. So again, that's Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 4. Are we all there? Anybody desire to be there that is not there? Amen. All right. All right. Glory be to God. All right. Nehemiah <laughs> chapter 6. Some people read it and can't see it. I ain't going to say no name. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, New King James Version reads as follows. If you can't see, just listen. Glory <laughs> be to God. But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sinbalat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you also, you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Verse eight, then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming in to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, 
should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sabalat had hired him. For this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way in sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might report, reproach me. Final verse. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works and the prophetess, no idea, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Ladies and gentlemen, again, if I had to anchor what the Lord has placed on my heart to share with you in scripture, it would indeed be in these particular verses. And I would indeed entitle this message, Walking in the Fear of the Lord. Walking in the Fear of God. You all may be seated. Family, as you all can see, we are dealing with the book of Nehemiah which is named after its principal character, a gentleman named Nehemiah, whose name in the Hebrew means Jehovah comforts or consolation of Jehovah. Now, keep in mind that at this point in time, typically a person's name was directly associated with that person's identity and or their assignment. So if we look at the words comfort and consolation, before we know anything else about Nehemiah, we can directly connect Nehemiah's assignment and or his identity with someone who was created to strengthen, created to support, created to improve and restore, created to ease grief or distress, especially and primarily after someone experiences the reality of loss and or disappointment. And before we dive deeper into the book of Nehemiah, I believe that it is key and critical for us to know that by this time in history, due to the blatant, and I do mean blatant, disobedience of God's people, God has caused his judgment to be executed in their lives. Hear me. Because of the anger of the Lord, which his people provoked, he has allowed certain things to take place in Jerusalem and in Judah, the place where his name dwells, his holy place, his holy land. And likewise, he has allowed his people to be removed from this place as he cast them from his presence. And as a result, during this time, 2 Kings chapter 25 advises us that the city walls are broken through and broken down. Now, what we must keep in mind is that the walls of a place at this point in time spoke to the establishment of a place, the strength of a place, the security of a place. Walls were a defensive work. They were protection from attack, protection from enemy invasion. So to say that the walls had been broken through and broken down is to say that this place was open and vulnerable, easily accessible. Hence the reason we are also informed that with this access granted, the gates, the house of the Lord, the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is all the houses of the great, they too are all burned with fire thus causing their place of promise to become a place of ruin and utter destruction. Now, with that being said, as I mentioned, at this time, the people of God in their entirety are also removed from the land, cast away from his presence, the majority of the people being carried away captive to Babylon. However, what we must know and what many of us may not realize is that the captain of the guard doesn't remove every single soul when Judah falls. No, he leaves some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers, and then he places a king over them accordingly. However, after a series of events, when it's all said and done, all the people small and great of those that were left in Judah find themselves rising up and going to Egypt. 
due to the fear that was present in their hearts of the Babylonian people, of the, the Chaldeans. Therefore, those who were left behind in Judah find themselves leaving Judah behind. Ultimately, fulfilling God's promise of judgment concerning both the people of God and the place of God accordingly. Now, with that being said, the people of God served under Persian leadership for 70 years. 70 years. Until their time of spoken judgment has come to an end. And then is when they begin to return to Jerusalem. But hear me. Even though they now have permission to go up, they have permission to return to their place of promise. The reality is many have gotten so comfortable, so familiar with their place of exile that they no longer desire to return home. I mean, think about it. 70 years has passed. So they have built homes there. They have planted gardens there. They have worked there, experienced promotion there. They have gotten married there, had children and even grandchildren there. Listen, they had multiplied in their land of exile. They had grown in a strange, unfamiliar and foreign land. And I really want us to think about this because for those that were born there, this is literally all that they knew. They knew nothing about the promised land. They knew nothing about God's best for them. They knew nothing other than what they grew up around. Grew up in. Was surrounded by. And that was Babylon. They knew false religion. They knew the language and the land of the enemy. And this was normal to them, although it was never meant to be. So what happens is their place of exile becomes their place of comfortability. Yeah, the place that was meant to be a place of judgment, that was meant to correct behavior and cause true repentance, it becomes a place of familiarity. A place that some were simply unwilling to part ways with. You see, their place of separation became more desirable to them than the work that was required of them to go up and thus build back up their place of promise. Okay. Listen, for those that were born in exile, leaving what they knew to go to a place where things were uncertain, where things were unsure, where things were in a, a state of destruction, where things were unfamiliar, this was probably scary and less desirable to say the absolute least. So many of the people of God, when given the approval of God, the permission of God to return to the place of God, they rejected the opportunity. You see, sometimes it's easier to stay in a place of dysfunction, in a place of exile in a place of bondage, in a place that you know that you were never meant to be. Because coming out of that place, coming up from that place, and walking into what God really desires for you, that, that takes work. Yeah, you, you might not be comfortable anymore. You might not feel as safe anymore. You might lose that sense of control and security that you once felt before. You might have to walk away from some things and some people who desire to stay where they are, who are unwilling to do the work that the promised land requires, unwilling to give the more that more requires. Yeah, you might have to be willing to be the minority. Realizing that some people will simply be unwilling to partner with you as you go up and rebuild in your promised land. So although many rejected this opportunity, some rose to the occasion and they returned to Jerusalem. Despite the reality that they were indeed the minority. So the minority begins to return home. And at this point in time, worship is restored in Jerusalem. Before they ever laid the foundation of a new temple, they rebuild the altar of God to offer burnt offerings on it. They begin to observe their appointed feasts and sacred days. In addition to that, they rebuild the temple and complete it despite the opposition that they face along the way. So 
when we get to Nehemiah, who remained in Babylon, serving in the palace, in the castle, in the winter residence of the Persian king, as his cupbearer, we are informed that Nehemiah receives a visit from some of his brethren from Judah. And during this visit, he inquires about the Jews, the people of God. And he inquires about Jerusalem, the place of God. And during this conversation, he is informed that the people of God are in great distress, experiencing great affliction, great adversity, great pain and misery and reproach, which means that they were living in a place and space naturally and or emotionally that expressed disapproval and disappointment. Listen, they were in a resting condition of shame or disgrace. What does shame and disgrace mean? Shame is defined as a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness, the awareness of wrong or foolish behavior. While disgrace speaks to a loss of reputation, a loss of respect as the result of a dishonorable action. Hear me, to say that someone is in a state of disgrace is to speak to the condition of one who is actually fallen from grace. One who has lost honor, lost favor, lost esteem, and is thus struggling emotionally with a pain caused by a sense of guilt, a sense of falling short, a sense of humiliation due to the reality that they have failed to do what was required of them thus demonstrating improper language, behavior, and or character. The people of God, despite returning to the place of God, restoring the temple of God, and engaging a worship of the same God, as they look at their surroundings, as they look at their land, as they look at each other, as they looked at what was left and they compared it with what was, with what was it's as if. They were consistently reminded of where they had missed the mark, where they had failed. And although restoration and healing had already begun, the reality of something still remained. Therefore, they found themselves navigating this very real emotional and natural space of shame, of disgrace, of pain, of humiliation, of dishonor and disesteem. However, in addition to this, Nehemiah is also advised concerning the place of God. As they inform him that the wall of Jerusalem was broken down and its gates burned with fire. Now this would serve not only as a lasting reminder of their previous behavior, but this would likewise serve as a sense of discouragement concerning their future. Because the reality of it was as long as the walls were down, as long as the gates were burned, there was no real sense of establishment. There was no real sense of security and stability. There was no real sense of strength and protection. Yeah, they could build, but even what they built, built was open to attack. It was exposed. It could be destroyed by an enemy with ease at any given minute. Yeah, they could live. They could eat. They could drink and be merry, but they had to do it cautiously. They had to do it realizing and recognizing that at any given moment, this too could be attacked. This too could be destroyed. This too could be carried away captive. And they could find themselves in this exact same position, experiencing the exact same thing as they had, ex had experienced historically. So yeah, I could work, but for what? Yeah, I could build, but for what? I'm doing it for nothing. I feel like I'm working and working and working for nothing, only for you to come in and take it at any given moment. Wow. Can anybody relate to this? You know, starting a journey of healing, beginning to experience this sense of restoration, only to feel plagued by your past and discouraged concerning your future. Hear me, have you ever felt like no matter where you looked, 
even as you begin to navigate your promise, that there were constant reminders of who you used to be, of what you used to do, of how you used to move and the mistakes that you have made. Yeah, have you ever? Felt like the reality of what remains in your current only seems to stir up those same feelings of disgrace, those same feelings of dishonor and disesteem concerning how you navigated this thing historically. Have you ever found yourself unable to shake this very real feeling of disapproval and disappointment? Now hear me, I know this isn't for everybody, but have you ever tried to build? Tried to move forward, tried to progress, despite how unworthy and shameful and discouraged and disappointed you feel, yet you still feel open. You still feel vulnerable. You still feel anxious and distressed because you honestly feel as if this thing could be attacked, stripped, taken away from you just like that. You ever feel like you will never really have a safe place, a place of promise, a place of strength, a place of stability, a place of establishment ever again, either because you messed this up so bad you don't deserve it or because you feel like the moment that you get it the moment that you fight for it the moment you put your all into it this too will be taken away from you this too will be burned down this too will be broken through this too will experience utter ruin and destruction leaving you in the exact same place yeah the the people of God and the place of God are in a really bad place. They're in a hard place, a distressing place. And when Nehemiah hears it, he responds to it. Now, listen, what we must keep in mind is that Nehemiah is not navigating what his brethren is navigating. He is not initially feeling what they are feeling. He is not initially seeing what they are seeing. No, Nehemiah is in a different place. He is in a place of royalty. He is in a place of strength. He is in a place of establishment. He is in a place of favor with the Babylonian yeah. king. He is not in Judah. Therefore, his experience is not theirs. Yeah. But despite this truth, despite this reality, he nonetheless demonstrates a level of care and concern as it relates to the Jews and to Jerusalem. And when he hears the report, Richard tells us that he, he sits down and weeps as he mourns for many days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Okay, don't miss this. Because what I'm saying to you is that Nehemiah, in this moment, begins to struggle emotionally. Not because of what he was going through. Not because of what he was facing. Not because of what was happening with him, but simply because of what was happening with them. Listen to me. It's as if what he heard concerning the people of God and the place of God stirred up something so much so within the man of God that collectively we see his natural, his spiritual, and his emotional state experience a shift. Okay, you don't believe me. It's in the text, family. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 says, when I heard these words, that I sat down, which means that he shifted naturally from a standing position to a sitting position, from a higher place or position to a lower place or position. He shifted his position naturally. It continues and says that he wept and mourned for many days. This word weeping, meaning to shed tears, to cry, to lament, and it is directly associated with grief and humiliation, which says that he more than likely began to feel the emotions that the people were feeling, realizing and recognizing that they were literally navigating the same state of humiliation. The state of shame, this state of disgrace, this distressing condition. So Nehemiah thus experiences a shift emotionally. Finally.
Finally, the text says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, which likewise seems to communicate that what this man heard not only shifted him naturally, not only shifted him emotionally, but likewise spiritually, as he now positions himself before the God of heaven with fasting and with prayer, not for him, but for them. This is why you cannot tell me that what you hear does not have the power to impact you naturally, spiritually, or emotionally. But that's another story for a different day. If I keep this thing surface level, the reality of it is Nehemiah heard a thing and what he heard shifted some things. Now listen, Nehemiah then lets us in on what his prayer sounds like. Because in verse five, he says, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh great and awesome God. Can we stop here for just a minute? You see, I don't want us to skip past this because what we must know is that the same word that is translated fear mm -hmm. and other places in scripture is translated terrible in the King James Version and translated awesome in the New King yeah. James Version. So if we take a moment to define those words, we will see that one of the definitions for terrible speaks to one who is formidable in nature, which simply means very powerful and strong. It speaks to one who inspires fear or respect due to the reality that they are impressively large, impressively powerful, impressively intense or capable, while the word awesome is defined as someone or something that is extremely impressive or intimidating, thus inspiring an overwhelming feeling of reference, of admiration, of apprehension or fear. It is to literally call someone to be filled with awe. So in essence, to refer to God as awesome, is to say that his nature, his character, his being, his presence is so impressive. It's so large. It's so powerful. It's so intense. It's so capable. It's so intimidating that it can't help but to produce an overwhelming feeling of respect, an overwhelming feeling of fear, an overwhelming feeling of honor, an overwhelming feeling of reference, of awe and admiration. Hear me to say that God is awesome, not only declares a truth about him yeah. but it should likewise declare a truth about you because to make this statement is indeed to declare that the very nature of God the very presence of God the very essence of God all that God is it stirs up something on the inside of you so declare with your mouth that your God is awesome is to declare that your God has inspired all he has inspired reference he has inspired fear on the inside of you so as we read this prayer, we have to read it knowing this, because this is not just Nehemiah making a declaration concerning God. This is likewise Nehemiah making a de declaration concerning him as one who is filled with awe, filled with reference, filled with the fear of God. He says, I pray, Lord God of heaven. Oh, great and awesome God. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of, of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against. You, not they. He says, we have sinned against yeah. you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. You and have against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances, which you commanded your servant Moses. Verse eight, remember, I pray. The word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are faithful. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the furthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them 
from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Verse 10, verse 10. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. Watch this, and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear, who desire to reference, who desire to respect, who desire to honor your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Hear me, this is Nehemiah's prayer. And it seems based on this prayer that Nehemiah has already identified that in order to operate in a way that is consistent with his name, in order to do what the occasion demands, in order to bring comfort, consolation, strength to the nation of Israel, strength to the people of God and to the place of God in order to improve the condition of the people after they have experienced loss and disappointment in order not to just pray for the people, but, but to be the answer to the prayer of the people. He seems to have already identified that he was going to need mercy. He was going to need mercy in the sight of the one he currently worked for in the sight of the king of Babylon. And the only one who could make this happen was his great and awesome God. Well, fast forward, because it seems that at least four months passed between Nehemiah chapter one and Nehemiah chapter two. Four months. Four months of praying and fasting, four months of struggling in this emotional state, four months of sadness and sorrow and weeping, four months. Yet one day, as Nehemiah takes the wine and hands it to the king, the king takes notice that Nehemiah is sad, which scripture advises us that this is an emotion that Nehemiah had never physically wore on his face in the presence of the king prior to this point. So in essence, Nehemiah makes a decision to unmask before the king, to show up as he really was, to allow his true emotion to show even in the face of the king. And the king says to Nehemiah, why is your face sad since you are not sick? In other words, the king says there is nothing wrong with you physically. You are not weak. You are not diseased. You are not grieved. You are not wounded. Naturally, if you were, then your sadness would make sense to me. Sometimes people want to make your, your emotions make sense to them. Yeah. So you're not sick. This doesn't make sense. Your countenance doesn't make sense. The emotion that you are wearing on your face would make sense if you were wounded naturally. If I could see, if I could pinpoint what's happening with you and I could make it make sense, that's not the case. Therefore, this thing, this emotion, this sadness, this sorrow that you are experiencing has to have a different source. And I want to know what that source is. This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Yeah, this, this is an indication that something is going on internally. Something is going on mentally. Something is, is happening emotionally. So the king, in so many words, simply says, what's happening? Well, the text tells us that, this king, that the king's question causes Nehemiah to be greatly or dreadfully afraid. Watch this same word used for fear or reference. So in essence, we can't fully separate what it means to be afraid, to be terrified, to be scared from what it looks like to reference, to honor, to be in awe. This word includes a combination of them both. And in this moment, Nehemiah is afraid. He's dreadfully, exceedingly afraid. Watch this of the king, not of God. But it seems that despite this reality, he does not let this very real sense of fear drive him. 
because this turns out to be the moment that he has been waiting for, the moment that he has been praying for, the moment that he has been fasting for. The time is now. He simply has to stand in the face of the king, stand in the face of what scares him, and reveal the truth behind the emotion that he just unmasked. And sometimes that's the scariest thing for us to do. Nehemiah responds to the king and says, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be set when the city, the place of my father's tomb lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? The king responds and says, well, what do you request? Nehemiah in this moment is found praying to the God of heaven before he responds and make a request of the king for him to send him to Judah, to the city of his father's tomb to rebuild it. In addition to, to this, he makes a request for letters to be given to the governors of the regions that he must pass through in order to get to Judah, along with a letter specifically for the keeper of the king's forest, that he would give him timber to make beams for the gates, for the city wall, and for the house that he would occupy. The text tells us that the king granted these things to him according to the good hand, the great power of his God that was upon him. So this means that Nehemiah is on the way. He is on his way to Judah, on his way to rebuild that which has been damaged, on his way to do a good work, a work that has been given, that he has been given both the permission and the resources to carry out. However, it seems that a couple of gentlemen by the name of Sambalit and Tobiah they hear of this. And the text says that they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Now, Paul, yeah. the reality is we have already seen in scripture with Nehemiah how what you hear has the ability to stir up emotion to shift dispositions, to move you to action. But in this moment, we see it again, but this time with the opposition. Scripture says when Sambalit, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard of it, they were deeply disturbed. What does it mean to be deeply disturbed? Well, the King James Version translates this word grieved. Yet the Hebrew definition itself means to tremble, to quiver, to be broken up, or to fear. To tremble speaks to an involuntary shaking. Typically as a result of anxiety, excitement, or frailty. It is to be in an extreme state of apprehension. Therefore, it is likewise defined as a physical or emotional condition that is marked by trembling. Huh. While to quiver is defined as to tremble or to shake, with a slight rapid motion. It is a trembling movement or a sound, especially one caused by a sudden, strong emotion, which in essence sounds a lot like what we described last week as an earthquake. Finally, to be broken up is defined as to become emotionally and extremely upset, with upset being defined as to make someone unhappy, disappointed, worried, or disturbed. So in essence, the text is sharing with us that the reality that someone had the audacity to seek the well-being, the welfare, the health, the happiness, the prosperity of the children of Israel, the prosperity of God's children, after they had experienced clear judgment, this thing, this reality calls the enemy their own emotional, internal, earthquake. This thing caused a shaking, a, a trembling, a quivering, a quaking. This thing caused them to be broken up as they navigated very real feelings of fear, of anxiety, of distress, of strong, sudden emotion as a result of what they had heard. Now fast forward, Nehemiah arrives and he views by night the walls of Jerusalem before sharing with anyone what was in his heart to do at Jerusalem. Therefore, he gathers them and says to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. He says, come, 
Let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Keeping in mind that re reproach speaks to a resting condition of shame and disgrace. That very real sense of disapproval and disappointment. Nehemiah ultimately says, let's deal with what's causing this to be our portion. Let's build the wall. He continues and tells them about the hand of his God that had been good upon him and also of the king's words that he had spoken to him. Therefore, they say, bet. Okay, they don't say that. They say, <laughs> they say, let us rise up and build as they set their hands or strengthen their hands to do this good work. However, once again, when Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and this time a man named Geshem hear of it, they laugh at them, despise them, and they say to them, what is this thing you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Nehemiah answers them and says to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. The God of heaven himself will cause us to succeed. The God of heaven himself will advance us and cause us to make progress. Therefore, we, his servants, we will arise. We will build, but you will have no heritage, no right, or no memorial in Jerusalem. This closes out Nehemiah chapter two. And when you get to Nehemiah chapter th three, they simply begin to detail the work the repairs that are being done. And likewise, it provides details concerning who handles those repairs accordingly, which ultimately brings us to Nehemiah chapter four, beginning at verse one. And it reads as follows in the New King James Version. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Verse three, now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, whatever they build, even if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. You ever feel like the enemy talking to you saying, even if you do do it, if the slightest thing happens, it's going to break. If the slightest thing happens, it's done. You might as well give up or not even start. This brings us to verse four, where we see Nehemiah respond, hear me, not to his enemies about his God, but this time he talks to his God about his enemies. And he says, hear, O oh our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Verse six, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Now, let's be clear. What this does in this moment is directly connect a person's desire to work with a person's emotional state. Yeah. All right. The word used for mind here is often translated heart. And it speaks not only to the moral character of a person, but to a person's thoughts, to a person's emotions, to a person's will and affections or passions. Therefore, if my desire is to keep you from working, then my goal will be to give you a heart attack. All right. Can I say that again? Yeah. If my goal is to keep you from working, uh -huh. then my goal would be to give you a heart attack yeah. as I attack your thoughts, as I attack yeah. your emotions, as I stir up unrighteous desires, yeah. as I stir up unrighteous passions and affections so that you no longer have the will, the desire, or the mind to do this good work. Yeah. Back to the text, verse seven. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, you see how this group keep growing? That is crazy to me. Heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed. 
that they became very angry. And all of them, watch this, conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Y'all, okay, listen. Don't miss this. Because what we see here is not only the strategy of the enemy, but the motive of the enemy. The text in so many words says that when their enemies heard that the walls were going up, when they heard that the work was being done, when they heard that progress was being made and that gaps were beginning to be closed, when they heard that restoration was really turning out to be a thing, that the breaches were being stopped and shut up and closed off, that the word that Nehemiah had the audacity to speak to them was actually coming to pass, that is when they became very angry. And that anger caused them to, to join together, to come into agreement secretly in order to attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Hear me. What I am saying to you is that the righteous movement of the people of God stirred up anger in the enemies of God. Therefore, the strategy of the enemy was to join together, attack, and confuse. Now, what I would like to do is deal briefly with this word that is used for confusion. The Hebrew word not only speaks to a sense of confusion or disturbance, but it likewise speaks to error, to wandering, to impiety and perversions. What is impiety, Jasmine? Impiety speaks to a lack of proper respect or reference for something that is sacred. It is directly associated with words that include but are not limited to ungodliness, immorality, irreverence, and unholiness. What is perversion? It is the alteration of something from its original course. It is to distort, to twist, to change the original meaning of something. It is to change something so much so that it is not what it was or what it should be. So in essence, what the text is saying is that the enemies of God's people conspired together to not only engage in warfare with the people of God, but to confuse the people of God. To cause a disturbance among the people of God. To stir up or accuse them of error. Accuse them of ungodliness. Accuse them of irreference. To pervert their righteous movement. So that the focus would be shifted and the work would cease. Listen. What I'm saying to you is not only should you look for the presence of confusion and disturbance as an indication that your movement has stirred up some things in the heart of your enemy, but you should likewise be looking for where the enemy has attempted to shift your focus and pervert your movement, movement that you know is righteous. Hear me, when all of a sudden you begin to question or to feel some type of way about what you were doing, about how you were moving, when you were once so sure that this was a God thing, a good work, could it be that the enemy is simply executing this strategy and you missed it? Wow. Back to the text. Verse 9 reads, Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Verse 10, then Judah said, the strength, the power, the might of our labor is this failing. It's weakening, it's struggling, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. So clearly, it's at this point where the people of God begin to get discouraged in their work where they begin to focus on what the enemy is highlighting, which is the rubbish, where they begin to speak the language of the enemy as they declare with their own mouth that this thing can't be done, that their enemy is going to come among them and kill them, causing their work to cease. It is here that it becomes clear that in a sense, the strategy of the enemy was working. However, Nehemiah is found speaking to the nobles, the leaders, and the rest of the people, saying the following. He says to them, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Hear me, just like we see the strategy of the enemy. And in a sense, it's success. We likewise see a righteous response to it just the same. Scripture says that Nehemiah looked, he arose, and then he spoke. 
to the nobles, the leaders, and the rest of the people. Let's be clear. The word used for looked here can also be translated consider, discern, or distinguish. So in essence, the text tells us that Nehemiah pays attention. He discerns. He sees what is taking place. He identifies what is happening. And then he rises up. He takes a stand. He stations himself as he then gathers the people together to encourage them. And what does the encouragement consist of? He begins ultimately by telling them what not to do. He says, do not be afraid of them. <laughs> Same Hebrew, Hebrew word used for reference or fear. Do not fear them. Do not allow yourself to be consumed with worry and overwhelmed with anxiety because of your enemy. Instead, this is what you do. He says, remember which means bring to mind, recall, think about, meditate on the Lord, who he then identifies as great and awesome. Keeping in mind that awesome is the same Hebrew word used for when Nehemiah says, do not fear them, referring to their enemy. So in other words, I want you to choose to fear God over your enemy. In other words, if you are going to allow fear to stir up on the inside of you, if you are going to allow any overwhelming emotion to stir up on the inside of you, let it be the fear of the Lord and not the fear of the enemy. I need you to remember who you serve. I need you to meditate on his greatness, on his intensity, on his capability, on his significance, on his weight. I need you to remind yourself of his power, of his character, of his awesomeness. And after you do so, I want you to fight. Listen, this word fight is defined not only as to engage in war or battle, but it likewise speaks to making a decision to continue moving forward with difficulty. Especially by pushing through or overcoming obstacles. So in essence, Nehemiah says, I want you to meditate and I want you to move. I want you to meditate and I want you to move. I want you to meditate and I want you to move. I want you to meditate and I want you to move. I want you to meditate on the Lord, great and awesome, and move forward. I want you to keep going. I want you to keep striving. I want you to keep working. I want you to keep fighting. Fight for your family. Fight for your children. Fight for your spouse. Fight for your household. Meditate and move. The text says this in the following verse. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. Well, fast forward, chapter five begins to deal with the people's behavior with one another. And without getting into much detail, we see two things. One, we see Nehemiah rebuking the leaders and the nobles, encouraging them to walk in the fear of God, specifically because of the reproach of the nations, because of their enemies. And two, you see Nehemiah sharing that he personally chose not to do certain things, not to engage in certain behaviors and or not to consume certain provisions simply because of the fear of God. So what we see consistently throughout the book of Nehemiah is both Nehemiah and the people of God choosing not only to fear God, but to walk in the fear of God. What does it mean to walk in the fear of God? Well, to walk speaks metaphorically to someone's manner of life, to the way that they live and behave on a normal, habitual basis. So in essence, the people of God allowed what stirred up on the inside of them concerning who God was to be what guided them in their life. In other words, they wore the reference that they felt. They lived according to the fear that was in their hearts. Their lives reflected their reference. You didn't have to ask them if they feared God because the way that they lived indicated, reflected that they feared God. God, therefore, they may do use of every opportunity presented to them to choose God, to honor God, to fear God above all. They walked in the fear of God. And this brings us to our final example of this that I will present before you today. And that is found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter six. 
And ultimately, this chapter opens up by advising us that the wall has been rebuilt. That there are absolutely no breaks, no gaps, no breaches left in it. And the only thing that is left to do is hang the doors in the gates. So he's almost finished. He's almost to the end. However, when Sanbeth, when Tobiah, Geshem, and the rest of their enemies hear of this, they send a message to Nehemiah, encouraging Nehemiah to meet with them in a plane called Ono. However, Nehemiah makes it plain that the heart behind this request was filled with the intent to do him harm. So in response, he sends messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work. So that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? Nonetheless, the enemies of Nehemiah send Nehemiah this message four times. And he answers them in the same manner. He says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? However, the fifth time. Sam Bellis sends his servant to him as before, but this time with an open letter in his hand. And this letter, in so many words, advises Nehemiah that rumor has it that Nehemiah is planning to rebel. Ultimately saying that the reason that he was rebuilding the wall was so that he could be declared king. Okay, don't miss this. In essence, if we simplify this thing, what his enemies are doing in this moment is bringing Nehemiah mess. Yeah. Mess. mess that will cause Nehemiah's character, Nehemiah's heart behind his action to be brought into question. Yeah. Sam Ballot was bringing Nehemiah lies. Yeah. Listen to me, when you are working, when you are building, and all of a sudden someone is on your phone, in your inbox, in your face, Telling you what someone else has had to say about you. Yeah. Telling you how someone else feels about you. Telling you that the streets are talking as it relates to your movement. And all of a sudden you feel this need to stop working and start defending yourself. To stop working and stop the rumor from going any further. To stop working and start investigating to find out who is saying what and why. Stop working and make sure that they see your heart. Make sure that they see your true intentions. Make sure that they know that this is not who you are so that they can see your moments. Please hear me. Yeah. It's a distraction. It's an invitation. And the moment you come down to address that thing is the moment your enemy has succeeded. Yeah. Stay focused and stay on the wall. Nonetheless, Nehemiah's enemies invite him once again to come down so that they could consult, offer counsel, come up with a plan before these matters were reported to the king. Nehemiah responds to this and he says, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. Scripture says in verse nine that ultimately the heart behind this thing was to make them afraid, to terrify them, to stir up fear in them, that their hands also symbolic of their strength, their power, their might, their hands might be weakened, disheartened, withdrawn from the work and the work would fail to be completed. As a result, Nehemiah simply says, now, therefore, oh, God, strengthen my hands. Now, after this, Nehemiah comes to the house of Shemaiah, a man whose name in the Hebrew means heard by Jehovah. Yet he seems to be shut in, confined in some way. And he says to Nehemiah, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple or the sanctuary, and let us close the doors of the temple. For they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. Nehemiah responds and says, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. The text says, then I perceived, I recognized, I acknowledged, I discerned that God had not sent him at all, but that he pro pronounced this prophecy. You got to be careful of even those in the church claiming that they heard by God, that God said this, God said that. He said it was because. Tobiah and Sambalit had hired him. 
or paid him. It continues to say, for this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way and sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. Nehemiah then says, my God, remember Tobiah and Sambalit according to these, their works and the prophetess, Noadia and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Listen, ultimately, what Nehemiah says is that his discernment allowed him to come to the understanding that even this man who apparently is in relationship with the true God, but was yet and still being paid by and used yeah. by the enemy. He's clear that this man was sent for the primary purpose of stirring up fear on the inside of him. But why did he want to stir up fear? Why did he want to stir up anxiety? Why did he want to attack his heart? Why did he want to stir up worry and confusion and doubt? Why did he want to stir up mess? Because it had the ability to impact his action. Listen, the text says, for this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin. The Hebrew word for sin here means not only to miss the mark, but to incur guilt to forfeit, to incur penalty, penalty or to bear loss. So in essence, the presence of the emotion was to move Nehemiah to unrighteous action. It was to cause him to miss the mark. It was to cause him to incur guilt. It was to cause him to forfeit this thing and bear the weight of that penalty and experience that loss. It was to cause him to sin against God. And as soon as he did so, it would likewise give a foothold to his enemy. Listen, it would grant the enemy opportunity. It would grant the enemy cause to spread an evil report concerning Nehemiah, thus causing Nehemiah to experience this resting condition of shame and disgrace. This very real sense of disapproval and disappointment. But Nehemiah, he peeps it. He discerns it. He identifies it. He fails to fall victim to it. And he prays that God would deal with it. And then he finishes the work. The text says, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Hear me and I'm finished. What we must realize is walking in the fear of God means consistently allowing the fear of God to take precedence over every other fear that we have, over fear of the enemy, over every sense of anxiety, over fear that of a fear of what they're going to say or think about you and how you move, over every other sense of worry and doubt. Listen to me, if anything that we hear or anything that we feel is going to have the power to stir up something on the inside of us so much so that it causes a dramatic shift naturally, emotionally, and or spiritually as a believer in the holy God. You better let it be the word of God combined with the fear of God. Let it be the truth of God combined with the reference of God. Let it be the place of God or the people of God, not the enemies of God. Let our fear of the Lord reign over any satanic or demonic invitation to fear anything else. Hear me clearly. We must realize, just like in the case of Nehemiah, that the more we work, the more we progress, the more we rebuild, the more we restore, the more we heal, the more we repair, the more we live lives that are in alignment with our names, in alignment with our identities, in alignment with who he called us to be and what he called us to do, the more we too will receive invitations. Yeah. Invitations to come down and invitations to cease the work. Hear me, family, you better believe that the enemy will absolutely try everything in his power to come up against you. He will attempt to mock you. 
He will laugh at you. He will despise you. He will put his mouth on you and what you have the audacity to do. He will attack you. He will threaten you. He will intimidate you. He will attempt to harm you. He will weaken you and discourage you with the good work that the Lord has called you to do. He will even accuse you consistently, constantly of rebellion, of being out of alignment, of being outside of the will of God for your life, of consistent getting this thing wrong. He will create a very real sense of confusion as he perverts what you know is righteous movement. But I need you to hear me clearly. I want to encourage you to take notes from Nehemiah as you send word back to your enemy. Simply saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot, I will not, I refuse to come down. Why in the world should I allow the work to cease? Why in the world should I take my attention off of what God has called me to do to come down and meet with you? Why in the world should I allow you to put fear on the inside of me so that my hands could be weakened and that the assignment will fail to be completed? Why in the world would I come down? off my cross because if Jesus came down off of his cross despite those that were mocking him despite those that were beating him where in the world would we be but like Nehemiah if we would just say oh now therefore oh God strengthen my hands and remember my enemy according to his works because I've got work to do I've got a wall to build I've got repairs to make I've got doors to hang I've got breaches to seal I've got gaps to fill I've got cycles to break I've got progress to make I've got a reproach to remove and I dare not Allow what I feel to take precedence over what I know. I dare not let the enemy move me, for I know I serve a God who is great and awesome. Therefore, when it's all said and done, and when my enemies hear that you have brought their plot to nothing, when they hear that this thing has been finished, when they hear and see all that you have done, I thank you, Lord, for the very real sense of inferiority that my enemies will now feel because they will know, they will perceive, yada, they will be perfectly aware of the fact that this work, this thing was done by my God. Listen to me, let not your enemy be given occasion to spread an evil report concerning you. Let not your enemy be given occasion to reproach you. Let not the enemy, let not the fear of the enemy cause you to sin against your God. You've got work to do and you simply cannot afford to come down. Stay focused and stay on the wall. So as I close, my prayer is simply that as the enemy attempts to stir up fear in you, that the Lord uses every single opportunity presented to you to strengthen you and remind you of who he is, thus allowing you to choose to fear him above all, resulting in both your enemies and all the nations surrounding you, perceiving a work so great, so extensive, that the fear of God can't help but to be their portion too. And on that note, I simply say, may God bless and keep each and every one of you. I now invite you to join me for a brief moment of silence.
Now, I don't know how the Lord has been dealing with you specifically, individually, but if by chance you are watching this and you don't know Jesus intimately, you have heard about him, but you have never accepted him, never tried him, never had the, sh the word shared with you in a way that made you even desire him. Yet maybe this word has done that for you today. Maybe this word has produced a righteous desire on the inside of you and you are ready to make the request for salvation in Jesus. You are ready to make him your Lord and Savior and try this thing called life his way. Or maybe for you, you know Jesus. But you feel this pull to rededicate your life to him because you have drifted away from him. You have fallen away from the truth. You have rejected the faith. You have been angry at him and chosen not to speak with him. You have been dabbling in things intentionally, consistently, habitually that are simply not like him. You have been in a state of rebellion against him because you're angry. You're mad. You don't understand how he has allowed certain things to take place in your life. If that is you, and you feel this pull, then I want to provide you with the opportunity to accept him and or rededicate your life to him today. I'm going to say a prayer, the same prayer that is coming up on your screens. And I want to pray. I want you to pray this prayer with me from wherever you are. If you're in the house, I just need you praying silently. If you would, repeat after me. God, without you, I am nothing. Without you, I am a sinner in need of the Savior. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you for allowing Jesus to be raised from the dead with all power in his hands. God, in this moment, I confess Jesus Christ to not only be your son, but to also be my personal Lord and Savior. As a result of this confession, I receive forgiveness. And I believe that I am now the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Sanctify me by your truth. Saturate me with your love. Have your way in my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Now, if by chance you were not saved prior to this point or you made a decision today, to offer your life back to him, please reach out to us so that we can celebrate you and provide you with some tools and resources as you embark on this beautiful yet challenging, sometimes very, 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 very challenging, like very challenging, like exceedingly and abundantly challenging <laughs> journey, right? But hear me clearly, whether you realize it or not, I would rather do hard with God than to do hard without him. So you have just made the best decision of your entire life. Heaven is indeed rejoicing and we would love the opportunity to rejoice right alongside heaven. Now, in addition to that, if you have relationship with Christ, you just need prayer for the journey. Or if you don't, but you don't fit, you feel that pull, but you're not ready to make that decision and you want us to pray with you, reach out to us. You can submit your prayer request to our leadership in uh, person or virtually. You can drop information in the chat or you can email us at info at many nations assembly dot org and we will follow up with you accordingly. Finally, family, if by chance you have joined us and you would love 
to join the great MNA, we would love to have you. Realizing and recognizing that many of our friends and family are not local, please know that you are officially able to join us virtually or locally by visiting our website at www.manynationsassembly.org. On that note, family, if there is nothing more, this officially concludes our Sunday service. Our prayer is that the Lord spoke to the hearts of each and every one of you individually and that you do indeed leave differently than you came. On that note, I'm going to cover you all in prayer and we will dismiss from there. Oh, great and awesome God. We thank you for your word. I thank you for the revelation that you have given us concerning just the word awesome. That as we, we navigate this coming week and we talk about how awesome you are, how amazing you are, help us to sit with the fullness of what those words mean as to what we're declaring, as to what it should say about you and to what it should say about us. And if those things are lacking within us, I ask that you stir up that sense of awe. I ask that you stir up that sense of wonder. I ask that you stir up that sense of amazement on the inside of us, oh God, so that we're making a de declaration from a, a pure place, from a genuine place and not from an empty space. Not just, God, because we no, it's the right thing to say, not just because we can't find the right adjective to describe you. Let us mean this thing when we say it. Let us feel this thing when we say it. Let us know, yada, intimately, experientially, that you are what we declare. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word. I thank you, God, for allowing this word to be carried with us. As we move forward, I thank you for expounding on it. I thank you for bringing it back to our remembrance. I thank you for even allowing us to sit with the scripture and getting more from it. I thank you, God, for making this thing as personal as it needs to be, as practical as it needs to be, so that we don't walk away just saying, oh, that was a good word. We walk away knowing what this means for us. We walk away seeking repentance. We walk away seeking strength. We walk away seeking, wondering exactly what it is you need from us personally, and then making a commitment to you to do that thing. Some of us struggle emotionally. And it's one thing to say it when we're not feeling the emotion, but it's another when we're frustrated. It's another when we're mad. It's another when we're sorrowful. It's another when we're just extremely anxious and wondering what's next and what's going to happen and who is going to, what's, what's coming after this and we're uncertain. It's another when we're just discouraged and depressed. It's another when we're feeling like we just don't even want to be here on this earth. So God, bring this word, your word, your truth back to our remembrance at just the right times and help us to switch our focus. Help us not to, to, to give in and bow down to referencing our emotion over the God that we serve. Help us not to declare with our actions that our emotion is bigger, that our emotion is greater, that if if God doesn't remove the emotion, then I can't obey him. But reality is this is just another opportunity to choose him. So despite how strong the shaking, the quaking, the upsetness may be, if that's a word, I pray that you help us to choose you, to fear you, to reference you, to bow down to you over anything and everything else. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk in the fear of you. And it's these and many other blessings we ask and we pray. Now may the Lord bless and keep each and every one of you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We love you all to life, family.
We wish you everything. Fear begins to operate in you around you and or 